Tim, uh, there's no way to do this justice in a couple of minutes, but if you can trace it real fast. Uh, how do you address the more uh, liberal tending uh, Christian arguments that say that the Bible condemns, when, it, when the Bible condemns homosexuality, it's actually talking about rich men molesting young boys or other forms? Yeah, I thought Josh did a great job speaking into that too during the sermon. Uh, but uh, there are many books. Uh, there, are a guy named Brownson uh, who wrote a book, uh, basically trying to dispel everything that Robert Gagnon wrote. Um, Matthew Vines has a has a recent book that uh, is written beautifully. Uh, we were talking beforehand. We really enjoyed reading the book where he tried to show basically everything that's written in the Bible was written contextually to a different context that we don't experience today. Um, and so uh, a lot of rape, a lot of things are, are being spoken to there. Um, most quickly without going into each one of those, uh, number one, I think when you look at the way it's written with the Greek words that are being used, uh, malakoi is the Greek word that is a man who is receiving without being crass here, but this is uh, the precision of the Greek language. Malakoi specifically is the word that's used as the man who is receiving penetration. Um, and then arsenikoitoi is the Greek word of the man who is doing the penetration. Like that is the, the, the technical um, uh, HD vision that we have in the Bible, uh, because, um, because Paul and the biblical writers and God loves us enough that he wants to be clear. Um, when you look at the way that the Greek sentences are constructed, uh, a human being could not communicate more clearly what God's view is on this and what God's desire is for his children. And uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16 as well, uh, even if, uh, the reason I mention that passage is because even if Paul, when he was writing, and even if the other biblical writers weren't aware of what homosexuality would look like in 2014, God was aware of what homosexuality would look like in 2014. And many times God as being uh, the author of scripture, moving in the people who are writing scripture, God is aware of what homosexuality will look like in 2014 and writes with such pre precision that there is no way that we can misunderstand him. And so, so I would just uh, look to the text very clearly and say that, you know, God loves us too much to allow there to be massive confusion on this issue. He wrote it as plainly as he could. That's good. That's good. Um, Josh, here's two that are very, very um, weighty because of how they, they impact people, and these are tied together. Uh, if a gay couple that has been married by state law for a few years both become believers, do they stay together knowing that it uh, is now a sin? Uh, and then another one is this. I'm a woman in a lifelong marriage with a woman. We have both experienced a journey that was not easy because of what the church taught us. Um, and some of, our, uh, uh, some of our questions were cut off at the end, so I didn't get the rest of that, but you're hearing kind of the tone that's coming through in that. Can you, you address it? Yeah, this... This again just goes to show that this is not an issue or a political football. This is about people. And when we start talking about topics like this and, and we don't remember the human factor, we move into the theoretical and out of the pastoral. And man, I'm not a theologian, I'm a pastor. And I love theology, but I, I, I want to serve people. And I want my theology to actually meet people where they are and help move them into loving and honoring and adoring God as he is. And so l let me try to answer that really quickly. Um, every person that follows Jesus, every person, gay, straight, young, old, every person that follows Jesus is going to experience the cross of Jesus in unique and different ways. There are things that Jesus is going to call each person in this room to do that are going to feel like death to you. And what's happening in our culture today is we've so said that Jesus is the easy button, that if you just follow Jesus and pray this easy prayer, that your life's going to be smooth sailing and you're going to be prosperous and healthy and wealthy and wise. Um, we, we've so made that the message of Christianity that we've made it really difficult to pastor people in situations like that. The Bible does not guarantee you prosperity and comfort um, f from creation in this life. But it promises you that as we follow Jesus, his grace is sufficient day by day. 
And it promises you that there's nothing that you give up in following Jesus that's not ultimately, completely, 100% and cosmically worth it. And so there are people in our church that are going to meet Jesus that are in monogamous, long-term, same-sex relationships. There's going to be a day where gay marriage is going to be legal in our country and people are going to meet Jesus that are in gay marriages. And, And I think Jesus is going to clearly call you to obey him fully. And what that means is, um, the injunctions against divorce, uh, only apply to the biblical description of marriage, which is a man and a woman. So it's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult, but there's going to have to be a reevaluation of that relationship in light of the Bible. And you're going to need help with that. And we're willing to walk with you through that. Um, it's not going to be without tears, but the nearness of God to the brokenhearted is going to be amazing. And you're actually going to experience Jesus in your particular calling to suffer in ways that are unique and beautiful and rich. And ultimately they're going to be worth it. Um, so I hope that that is a sufficient answer to that. Um, this complicated question is going to start affecting kids. So gay couples that are married and have adopted children, what are they to do when they follow Jesus? And I just, I just want you to know that unless we start with understanding what the gospel really is, we're, we're going to be absolutely lost in the woods in the next 20 years of American culture. So that's the point of trying to do this sermon today is is we want us to think biblically and we want us to be wise to the human factors. And we want us to see the gospel as the central message of the Bible, which is great news, but it also is news to come and die, right? Jesus died for you. You don't do anything to earn his love, but his calling to every man as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is a calling to come and die. And you're not going to be your own. And ultimately what he says is that if you try to keep your life, you lose it. If you lose your life for his sake, you actually gain it. 